welcome to our new podcast of Harbury Road. Uh, for people who are new of our community, uh, Harbury Road is a European progressive uh, think tank whose major goal is to inform the public community and open the discussion on important topic uh, on social, economic, health and digital field. So uh, Arbory Road hosts debate between different parties and the idea is to make proposal that could change the Europe vision for a better future. Uh, this is a grassroots project and you can find more information about Arbory Road on our website, arboryroad.eu. And uh, uh, you can also donate and support our volunteer. My name is uh, Caterina Garone and I hold a medical and scientific background. And today we will attend together a podcast on hand of life treatment to our European legislation. My honor and pleasure to introduce uh, uh, today panelists, uh, Mrs. Sophie Hintveld and uh, Mr. Marco Cappato. Uh, let me introduce first Ms. Hintveld. Ms. Hintveld has been a member of the European Parliament since 2004. She is a member for the Renew Europe Group and serves as a parliamentary leader of the delegation of the Social Liberal Dutch political party Democrat 66. Uh, Sophie Hintveld has built a, a profile around a number of priority like privacy, fundamental right, rule of law, migration and asylum, and pension. Uh, this priority guide our thinking uh, as a member of Free European Parliament Committee, the Civil Bi Liberty, Justice and Home Affairs, LIBE Committee, the Constitutional Affairs, and the Budgetary Control. So welcome, Ms. Hinterwald. Thank you very much. And uh, Mrs. Mr. Marco Cappato is a European politician and activist former member of the European Parliament, treasurer of the Associazione Luca Cossoni and founder of Humans. Priority of this activity as human rights and particularly the right to science and the right of science. Among the campaign that seem as a protagonist, we can mention the legal euthanasia, the uh, legalization of cannabis and the carbon pricing. Uh, one of the main pillars of the uh, Marco movement are the participatory democracy that seen millions of Italians this summer fighting for hand of life treatment regulation. So welcome, Marco. So I will first thank you, very thank, much. thank you both for agreeing participating to this podcast. It will be an open discussion and I like that we all share uh, our idea and opinion about this important matter. Since I introduced Arbor Road and this is a collaboration with the human, I would like you know ask Marco to introduce also the humans as a foundation. Please, Marco. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Caterina. Uh, humans as a pan-European movement is uh, trying to uh, promote. Uh, uh, political goals through civic participation. So not really through elections, but through the activation of instruments of participatory democracy. And we are going to hold uh, in uh, Warsaw, in Poland, our founding Congress on March 11 and 12 uh, next March. Thank you. So uh, today's topic is end of life treatment. And since it's a very delicate topic. Uh, I think it will be great if we give some definition uh, and so we can have our community on our same page. So first, why? what is hand of life treatment? And uh, why we call uh, the right of self-determination and also what is dignity at the end of life? So please, Sophie or Marco, as you prefer. Sophie. Oh. Well, maybe Marco should should kick this off. Um, <laughs> I'm, well, I, I'd, I'd like to 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 shine my light on another angle, but first, okay, Marco. Yeah. okay, so you prefer well, um, and end of life de decision is the most uh, 
uh, I mean, the widest definition that we can uh, apply to this issue, which is not only uh, the decision of terminating uh, a life, but also uh, palliative care and all the treatment that can assist an ill person in the process of ending his or her own uh, or life. So uh, some of those uh, issues are not uh, politically contentious or morally contentious. Uh, when you think about palliative care, you just have uh, to respect uh, the, the will of the person and the indication of the, of the doctor. Uh, of course, when you talk about uh, euthanasia, then uh, you, we enter in a domain uh, which does not find unanimity uh, in the public uh, opinion and also in the, in the political uh, spectrum. Um, what is, I think, relevant under this angle is that uh, uh, the, the end of life, we are talking about end of life decision, and the end of life is no longer uh, a short moment, uh, thanks to the progress of scientific uh, research and medicine, um, the process of dying or ending life, it's becoming more and more a long process. And it is a part of life. So I think that the debate is becoming more and more important because the span of time of life uh, uh, in, in which uh, end of life decisions are relevant is becoming more and more important. And when we talk about dignity, I think we have to uh, accept a very subjective idea of dignity. There is not such a um, dignified or undignified. Um, everyone should uh, be in a position to decide where the treasure of dignities of suffering, for example, or assistance uh, should be set. So. Uh, I, I think that uh, the only way of considering the, con the concept of dignity applied to end-of-life decision should be combined to the idea of freedom. There can't be an objective dignity to be imposed through the law, neither pro-euthanasia, neither against euthanasia. There is not such a thing as an objective measure of suffering and dignity and uh, tolerance of sufferance or undignity of a certain condition. So, if, yeah. please, Sophie, please. Yeah. No, I entirely agree with that because you cannot define dignity because it's, it's an individual experience. What is important is autonomy. Uh, and the moment you don't have autonomy, automatically you also don't have dignity. Um, so that's a very, uh, very important element. Secondly, I think uh, Marco is, is right when he says that the, the question is changing because of uh, uh, the, the advances in medical science. At the same time, the question has always been around. Uh, and even, even countries who say, you know, the, the, we have no debate about euthanasia or assisted dying or end-of-life treatments because you know, it doesn't exist, we don't talk about it, it exists. It exists everywhere. The question is not, does it exist? The question is, is it legal? Um, it's, it's pretty much the same with abortion. Abortion exists everywhere. It also exists in Poland. It's just, you know, not legal. Um, and, and that is, and I think in particular, end-of-life uh, decisions should be taken in, in an atmosphere of serenity. People should not be burdened with, uh, you know, a fight against the authorities or, or maybe even, you know, people in their vicinity who want to uh, impose something. And that is very, very 
uh, important. And what you what you see in the Netherlands, because we were the first country to uh, to, to legalize it, to make it legally possible, of course, uh, you know, in a very strictly regulated context. The funny thing is that um, there are actually, let's say, after an initial uh, an initial uh, 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 increase in in the number of cases, it then decreased. Why? Because a lot of people felt reassured by the fact they had a choice. They didn't necessarily sort of years in advance decide that they wanted euthanasia at the end of their life. But the fact they had a choice, the mere fact they had a choice was reassuring. And that is the dignity, that is the, the autonomy. Uh, and I think uh, the, uh, uh, another element in, in addition to uh, uh, you know, whether it is legal or not, or whether it's regulated or not, is the fiction that it's not a European topic. Funnily enough, I mean, the, the opponents of regulated uh, end of life uh, care, let's say, uh, and, and regulated euthanasia and assisted dying, they're the exact same people who in, uh, uh, in, in, in the early uh, noughties, let's say, at the beginning of the century, when, when in the Netherlands it was legalized, those very same people, Christian Democrats, they went to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg uh, and said this is this is uh, you know against uh, this is against human rights. Uh, this Dutch law has to be struck down. So they turned to a European court uh, and referred to European human rights in order to strike down the law. And but then when the the proponents, when the the advocates of uh, of this right are are having a European debate, then the opponents go, oh, no 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 no, this is not. This is not a European matter. We shouldn't be talking about this. And this is they, they do this all the time. It's the same when it comes to to uh, uh, abortion or, uh, uh, or or equal marriage, for example. You have these ultra religious groups who, who say, oh, this you know, family law is, is not an abortion. That's all not European competence. But then they took a European citizens initiative to you know, trigger legislation, banning abortion, uh, uh, banning uh, equal marriage uh, via European backdoor. So it's, I think we, sh we should not be intimidated by this argument and we should not be cornered and say, yes, of course, it's national competence. Look, we have all seen in the COVID crisis, uh, health, human health, public health is very much a universal issue. So let's have this debate at European level as well. Yeah, so that, that's very important as a, the self-determination, so autonomy, as you mentioned, is a human right, and so then it must be protected. But this is not, uh, unfortunately, uh, present worldwide. So uh, can, you, can you give us, and you know, you mentioned that Netherlands was the first country who get the legalized, legalized euthanasia. Can you give us an historical perspective and an overview about, you know, uh, a country where this debate has been open and country where, you know, we're still uh, on uh, uh, a bit behind about that. Well, I think Marco has uh, is, is probably uh, uh, has has these these uh, the facts more uh, readily available of which countries exactly have uh, have have legalized. We know that there, you know, the Netherlands was the first, uh, Belgium. Uh, there are a couple of other countries that followed or countries which have legislation underway or legislation that goes a bit less less far. But I suppose, I mean, there is there is debate everywhere because precisely of what Marco says, you know, as soon as uh, as there are medical um, as medical interventions are possible, uh, then you also have to answer the question, you know, uh, whether it can be used, under what circumstances, for whom, um, and 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 so the dilemmas will, the ethical dilemmas will will present themselves. <laughs> you don't have to look for them; they will they will present themselves, uh, and they are everywhere. So and and sometimes you know the the debate can all of a sudden go very rapidly, or it can be stalled for years. Yes, I I can confirm that the. The, the debate is open everywhere. And uh, I remember a few years ago, an international study by The Economist um, referred to, not to legislation, but to public opinion. And almost everywhere in the world, 
the majority it can be a slim majority or a vast majority of people are ready for uh, rules uh, of at least partial regulation of euthanasia. This is a, is a worldwide phenomenon. Um, in some countries, it is already legal. Of course, in the European Union, we're talking about the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Spain. Um, Portugal um, passed the law, but it was blocked by the president and the constitutional court. Um, at the same time, Austria um, uh, made a law on uh, on uh, assisted suicide, medically assisted suicide. There is an important um, decision of the constitutional court in Germany in the direction of uh, the full autonomy of the patient. Uh, and uh, legalization is foreseen for at least in Colombia, in South America, and uh, in some of uh, um, um, in some states in the United States of America, um, especially through referendum. In Switzerland, of course, you have uh, uh, legally um, medical assisted suicide in Canada and in part of Australia. But I think what is striking, because you could also consider that this is a is a minority if you consider the 190 nations in the United Nations. But what is striking is that nobody uh, went back. Um, we are talking usually, we are talking uh, of uh, democracies. And what is important is that public opinion always maintain support to those kind of regulation, um, which means that uh, the famous theory about slippery slope that everybody would uh, have been killed, uh, disabled people and old people and so on. Uh, well, this kind of thing could maybe happen in a dictatorship, but I'm sure that uh, democratic public opinion would react uh, in, in and exactly and it's it's the opposite it's exactly. in countries where it's not regulated where people are not safe exactly because you know if if there is no law then people will will take matters into their own hand hands and that is where you know uh, doctors or relatives uh, or others are, are are working in the dark uh it's you know if you regulate it brings things to light is it solving Every single ethical dilemma, no, because it's you know it's an ongoing debate also in the Netherlands because there will always be new ethical dilemmas. But it is a fiction to say that countries that haven't legislated that you know that there is no euthanasia. I mean, you've all we're all familiar with the the famous uh, uh, Haneke movie Amour. Uh, I mean, that is the kind of um, that's the kind of dilemma that people are are struggling with everywhere, everywhere. If you see a loved one suffer so terribly then you know people are inclined to take the law into their own hands um uh, inversely there may also be people who have reasons to uh, uh let's say speed up uh somebody's death um doctors are put because this is also doctors are, are where it's not regulated doctors are the ones who have to take the legal risk who may have to uh, to, to to help somebody end their life in whatever way, and, and they will be inclined to do it because they feel responsible for um, treating their patients, for ending the, the suffering, and yet in doing so, they risk um, uh, you know, being convicted for a criminal act. So if you regulate, you don't actually, let's say, uh, increase the number of uh, difficult situations, you decrease them because you, you give people a space where it is possible to find solutions. And as I said at the start in the Netherlands, ever since legislation was introduced, uh, the number of, 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 of cases is actually going down because people feel that now all the options are open. Definitely. There's another, uh, Katrina, there is another important legal point because if it is true that uh, only few countries already legalize euthanasia, the vast majority of uh, democratic and rule of law countries are accepting uh, the fact that you can legally interrupt uh, uh, life-sustaining treatment. Uh, 
uh, which, for example, in Italy, at the basis of all the jurisprudence, the juridical decision on end of life decision, there is this principle, which is uh, uh, included in the Italian constitution, that nobody uh, can be obliged to a medical treatment. Uh, of course, this idea, it is not legal euthanasia, but uh, it carries with it uh, important consequences uh, in, a, in a path that can lead to uh, medically assisted suicide and, and euthanasia. And the Oviedo Convention, talking about Europe and the Council of Europe in this case, also foresees that uh, the will of the patient should be taken in consideration. Uh, and uh, even if this is not a mandatory indication for a living will, it is still a general principle um, useful to support living will legislation and in general, the concept of autonomy that Sophie was talking about before. So uh, I, I have a provocatory question, actually. So you describe a kind of a scattered situation in Europe. So not all of the country are in the same page. But if I have a health condition, I'm, I'm an Italian citizen. If I go to Paris and I feel sick, I will be assisted because I'm a European citizen. Would it be the same for an end of life of treatment? If I move from Italy to a country where you know this, there is a regulation of for end of life treatment, would would I be assisted in the basically, same way? The answer is basically yes, uh, even if sometimes it's more in theory than in practice. Um, Switzerland is the only country in the world who is accepting um, patients coming for abro from abroad without a link to the national health system. Um, so uh, you cannot, for example, from Italy, you cannot travel to the Netherlands just to have euthanasia. You should be recognized as a patient for the Dutch health system, which in practice makes uh, uh, not available this, uh, this possibility. But if you are uh, in charge of a national system, there is also the, the principle of uh, free circulation of patients. And uh, this is one of those principles we are working on with uh, Sophie, uh, also to ask uh, for a better coordination and even harmonization of uh, uh, right of patient on this uh, on this matter. I think there is there there are uh, there are some obstacles also of a let's say somewhat practical nature in that well first of all somebody may be too ill to travel, um, but also in the Netherlands for example uh, one of the conditions is that you uh, there, there's a whole procedure you have to go through uh, in order to get authorization you know you can't just say oh well. Uh, Today is Friday, Monday. Um, I want to 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 end end life, but um, uh, you have to have a um, how do you say this in English? There there has to be a uh, let's say a, a stable um, relationship in terms of medical treatment with a doctor. You cannot just go to any doctor and say uh, you know okay we've never met before but I want this. Um, of course, if, if your own family doctor doesn't want to cooperate, then uh, he or she will have to refer you to another doctor. Uh, so that would be a different, uh, a different uh, situation. But uh, so this is also an obstacle because let's say, even if you move to the Netherlands, you, you register, you're, you, uh, you know, on day one, you're registered in the national uh, health system, then still, you know, a, a family doctor will want to get to know you in order to be able to assess whether your, your wish uh, is indeed, let's say, is, is a stable one, well thought through, uh, et cetera. So it's not, there are these built-in safeguards against, um, uh, against, let's say, frivolous 
decisions uh, if you want but that, that makes it difficult for people indeed to, to travel out contrary to for example uh, abortion where you can travel to another country and then of course there also i mean we're talking now the whole time about people let's say adults who are uh, who are still clear uh, who 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 can take their own decisions but there's so many cases uh, infants, uh, Marco remembers well the, the television debate uh, we had at the time uh, about in the Netherlands, there's a, a program um, uh, in, in, in an academic hospital where newly borns who have uh, conditions that cannot be treated and who are really suffering immensely, uh, they will, um, you know, the doctors are not going to, to do everything to keep them alive. Um, so they let them, it's kind of like palliative care, knowing that they will, they will die uh, by themselves, basically. Um, and of course, these babies cannot express a will. And there was big outrage in Italy at the time. And we were, the Netherlands were compared to, uh, to, to the Nazi regime. And, but the thing is, in, in other countries, these babies will also die. But first, they will be kept alive for many months, suffering and all. <laughs> and then they will still die. Uh, but in the statistics, it looks as if, uh, you know, as if the number is much higher in the Netherlands, only because they don't appear in the, 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 the newly born statistics. And then there is also there are also other ethical questions like what to do with people who are uh, uh, who, who are suffering from dementia, from Alzheimer uh, and who have uh, when they were still clear, they expressed expressed a very clear wish that you know, should they ever be in such a horrible condition that they, they want euthanasia then, but then it's very difficult when you get to that point, you cannot not yourself express that wish anymore. So the doctor will have to rely on the statement that you've made earlier. It is allowed in the Netherlands, but it's very, very difficult. Uh, or a situation whereby, uh, for example, uh, a minor, a teenager, for example, is, uh, is, is, is suffering and, and, and wants euthanasia, wants uh, end of life. Um, and say it's somebody 15, 16 years old, 17 years old, so somebody you know, old enough to take decisions, and yet it's, it's for the parents. And if the parents say we don't want it, then you know, what is, is it the interest of the child? That comes first, or is it the, the you know the fact that parents have uh, have the custody over the child? I mean, those are those are ethical uh, decisions. Another debate that we are having is whether people who are who are old, but they're not they're not sick, you know, they're in good health, but they just feel that you know their life is complete. They don't want to continue to live. They say, "I had a happy life, but it's over. It's it's enough. I don't want any more." Um, should they be allowed to just, um, you know, to get to, to, to get medication and take their own life? I mean, this is what many, or many people, not many, but people are doing, but it's, they cannot, they have no access to such medication legally. So then they are, they are resorting to things they can buy on the internet. Uh, uh, and that's not always a pleasant death. Uh, and it's not legal and people, it's not legal to help them. So those kind of questions have not been resolved. And I'm pretty sure that there will never be, let's say, a 100% final definitive watertight answer to these questions. And there shouldn't be because they are indeed uh, uh, complicated dilemmas. But that is when we get back to what you said at the start, this is where dignity in terms of autonomy, in terms of freedom, in terms of own choice, uh, that is the only principle that that should really dictate the outcome of these debates. Yeah, that, that's very, very important, the comment that you made, because um, euthanasia is one word, but actually it has several implications because there are some criteria, type of patient that can access to that. And then there are, you know, protocol procedure to follow that are different patient by patient. So the regulation, upon that, so not everyone can access to the euthanasia. And I think the most important thing that you said is patients are not left alone. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you do by yourself, what we can call suicide, you are left alone, and perhaps that's not the best way to die. Well, if you follow a procedure, you have a stable connection with a doctor, then you can find also the most appropriate way to 
and you're you know suffering because we are talking about people who are suffering so uh, I, I think that you know the important of you know and also another um, question that raised Marco is about procedure um, so uh, when we talk about euthanasia we, we actually talk about two main procedures that perhaps Marco can explain but uh, one is the assisted suicide and the other one is the medical assisted dying and this is also different you know from country to country in, and the regulation to regulation so Marco could uh, you um, yes um, this uh, difference uh, in my eyes uh, it is not so much important but if it's true that uh, there are legislation who are making a very strong difference uh, for example, in uh, Switzerland, you cannot have euthanasia as an active from a doctor, for example. Which is uh, the medical assisting dying, correct? Exactly, medical assisting dying. Uh, on the other hand, in Belgium, uh, it is not legal to have a medically assisted suicide. So uh, what in Switzerland is the only way that the patient himself or herself has to uh, to take the substance, the, the lethal substance uh, leading him or her to death. In Belgium, you cannot do, do it by yourself. The doctor has to do that. In the Netherlands, you can choose. And the, the vast majority of people choose to be helped by, uh, by the doctor. Uh, in my opinion, from a moral point of view, and as a consequence from a legal point of view, it, it, it should not make such a big uh, difference. The real political point and issue and also moral issue is at, at which condition you give to a person the right to die. But then the way in which, the process in which, uh, the, the, the instruments and, um, in which this is realized, I think it, it is of course important, but it is not the most uh, important point. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, the only, in my opinion, of, of course, uh, the only uh, counter argument of some value uh, is from people who are worried about uh, the lack of assistance and treatment of uh, patients. Um, and, and they object, and on this point they are right, that uh, very often people who are asking to be helped to die, in reality, they are not treated appropriately. Um, mainly on a psychiatric point of view, they can be helped uh, or to even socially, they have people alone or not very well treated from a psychiatric point of view. But Still, even if you take this argument as a good argument, it is not a good argument to prohibit uh, euthanasia or uh, medically assisted suicide because just because, exactly because of the legal uh, regulation, you can get in contact with them. Uh, if you prohibit simply those people will not trust their doctor or the state in general and they will find solution by themselves so even if um, you use this argument which is very different from the ideological uh, argument of uh, uh, we are not master of our, our own life of course this is uh, the major uh, philosophical and moral ethical argument to deny autonomy on end of life decision and if you follow this argument there is no real possibility of discussion because if someone says that life is not uh, 
something that we can decide upon, uh, there is not much to discuss. But if the uh, objection is, uh, is a pragmatical objection, I think that uh, the countries in which euthanasia has been legalized are demonstrating that even practically speaking, there is much more possibility of helping a person, even changing their mind. Sophie before was making the parallel with abortion. And I think uh, it, it is a good parallel also under this angle. Um, it is true that maybe a woman, some women that are uh, choosing abortion, maybe if they are helped, they could change their mind. But only if abortion is legal, you can have this kind of open dialogue. If yeah. you push them into the black, uh, uh, and even, if, and even if it's not a black market, and at least a, a black area, a black zone, or a dark zone where n nobody can help the person, on a practical level, this could mm -hmm. uh, uh, create more danger for the patient. Yeah. It's funny you refer to that because just this week the, the Dutch parliament uh, was discussing a proposal to, uh, uh, and, and there will be a majority, to eliminate the, uh, the mandatory five-day reflection period uh, for an abortion because women are of course not rational creatures as we all know so they cannot possibly decide for themselves you need to oblige them to sit down for another five days and think about whether they really 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 want this I always think it's funny that you know women are not considered to be rational enough to take this decision but apparently they are rational enough to then put the creature on the world and be responsible for him for the next 20 years or so um, but um, no but there's this indeed the whole idea that people people are unable to decide for themselves and of course there is the issue of what what i would summarize um as as the quality of life um and this is this is uh, objectively an issue if people because of material circumstances for example uh do not have a good quality of life uh, and would therefore maybe be more inclined to say well you know it's 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 not worth it anyway uh, but that is something we have to address as a society. And then ultimately, it will still be up to the person to decide whether or not the suffering is bearable. We have this, we have, uh, uh, there is one condition in, in Dutch, which would translate something like uh, uh, suffering uh, has to be unbearable and, and without perspective of, you know, improvement. Uh, we have a simpler formula in, in Dutch, but that is a condition for euthanasia, as we call it, to be, to be legal. But um, just as only the pregnant woman can decide whether or not she wants, uh, you know, there is a place for, uh, uh, for a baby in her life, you know, she decides whether that is possible. Uh, the person who is seeking uh, euthanasia should also be the one determining whether or not the suffering is bearable. Nobody else can decide that for you. And, and what the limit is, you know, where, what is, what is bearable and what isn't, that is purely individual. What one person considers to be unbearable, somebody else will happily bear for, for many years. I mean, it's, you know, and, and, and you, should, you should allow people to determine that for themselves. And, and this is probably something that, you know, should be um, also protect from the European Union. So you, you, you both signed an important letter and you addressed to the European Parliament um, claiming that self-determination as a human right and as a human right as being protected by the U European Court. And I was part as a scientist, I was particularly impressed about that letter for one specific point, the lack of data and the lack of funding on research about you know, protocol, procedure, and also the regulation itself. And so uh, um, I, you know, I would like to, you to comment on this and also ask if you, know, if you receive any feedback on that letter. Sophie, on that point. 
No, well, you know, you you always get the same. We we haven't had, let's say, uh, you 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 never get any any substantial answers to these questions. I mean, of course, we've been asking these questions many many times before, but the Commission will just sort of panic when they get letters about these topics because they know that national governments are going to immediately say, you know, this is not European uh, competence and it's very it's very thorny, it's a very an emotional debate, so they're going to try and stay away from it because it's not, um, they, they, they cannot, it's not a technocratic thing. Um, but that's silly because if you, if you look at the national health systems, uh, you know, all these issues, uh, end of life care in whatever form or abortion, it's all part of the national health systems. You know, no matter how it's regulated in one way or another, and, um, uh, and so, and the funny thing is that the Commission has funded, sort of generously funded, research into uh, palliative care, uh, but it, it refuses to fund, um, well, it refuses to fund, it's sort of avoiding to fund projects uh, relating to, to research into euthanasia. And of course, the Commission is saying, oh, but we can't help it. There are simply no requests. But you know you can it all depends on how you how you uh set the conditions for for these research uh, programs and um but i think there should also be more more bottom up push more bottom up demand uh for research and i think that after after uh covid uh or triggered by covid i think everybody now recognizes that we need a European health union. Well, if that is true, then end of life is as much part and parcel of a health union as the start of life and everything in between. I, I totally agree on that because you know if we are equal under the European Union as a right, we should be equally treated also under a, a you know no. same health system. Then of course, you know, the indication on the European Commission can be you know implemented in a different way, country to country, as happened for the field, but at least we should have, you know, common uh, line, common guideline uh, to follow, starting from, you know, the beginning of life uh, up to the end of life. So in Italy, this, you know, we, 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 this, um, you know, the, the lack of data and the, of course the lack of a standardized procedure became particularly important for a specific case which is the case of Mario uh, who is you know uh, asking uh, the health system to you know to uh, an assisted suicide but there is no protocol and so you know just simply you know the doctor say you know we don't know how to do it there is nothing written on uh, so Marco was particularly involved on in this case, and so probably can you comment on that, Mark? Yes, Katrin, because in reality what happened is that Mario, um, a patient um, completely disabled uh, since uh, 10 years, asked me, uh, not asked me, uh, informed me about the fact that he was going to Switzerland to get assisted suicide. And I explained to him that he already had the right to obtain medical assisted suicide in Italy, thanks to the um, decision of the Constitutional Court on my case. Uh, and then he started a legal battle, which is going on since uh, 17 months, uh, because the regional health system in uh, Regione Marche is simply refusing to um, to respect the law. This is what uh, is what's happening. So, uh, and uh, mm, this is very peculiar to Italy. You are entitled to a right in theory, but, but then in practical terms, the lack of procedure is uh, uh, creating a de facto prohibition, which is even more difficult to eliminate than a legal mm -hmm. prohibition. That's a very, very, very important problem. It's a bit like a uh, failure to act, basically. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Okay, but can't, you can challenge failure to act. Yes, but we had already two um, uh, decisions from a tribunal 
uh, ordering to the the health system to to go on with the procedure and we even denounce them uh, as a penal responsibility mm. of uh, imposing a suffering against the will of a person so uh, with the the allegation that we put in the that that that, 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 that mario put in the denunciation is a, an allegation for violence against him so we are waiting also for this uh, uh for this process to get to an end. It's incredibly courageous, I have to say, people who are conducting such a battle when they're in such a condition. I mean, can you imagine? Uh, yes, yes. Well, in theory, going back to the European, uh, uh, in theory, uh, he could also have access, if I think about, for example, Austria, which just, um, legalized assisted suicide, I think and he, in theory he could travel to Austria. So uh, we are also thinking about this, uh, uh, this possibility. But uh, uh, another thing that I wanted to say about the letter that you mentioned uh, is that um, um, there is something that many, many European countries share, which is uh, legislation on living will, which is respecting the will of a person which is no longer in condition to express uh, his or her current will. So the idea that we are working on, and we will discuss at uh, the Human Congress in Warsaw in March, is exactly to create uh, a minimum protocol, not uh, of uh, a European legislation on living will, because this will not be recognized as um, within the competencies of the European Union, but at least for as um, sharing of data, which is the thing that we are already doing uh, for COVID. Uh, uh, legislation about COVID are national legislation, but still we have uh, a sort of sharing of information to allow travels. So uh, we think that if you are an Italian patient and you are in, in France for work, maybe you are a few months in, in France and something happens to you, uh, you should have uh, an, an easy way for French doctor to know what your will what the will of the person uh, were if she or he made uh, the living will in Italy. So to create a kind, a sort of interoperability of mm -hmm. living will or sharing of data, uh, we put this under the name of a European living will, is something that we are working on um, from a legal point of view, uh, firstly, because uh, we need to have a solid European legal basis, and then maybe we could transform it in a bottom-up proposal, as uh, Sophie was suggesting, maybe through, I don't know if a petition or a European citizen initiative, but uh, to, to try to uh, raise this uh, uh, problem, but also opportunity within the European Union. Oh, but that's the strange thing because everything is political. Technically, there is absolutely no obstacle. I'm, I'm maybe a, a, a slightly less pessimistic than, than Marco. I think legally it should be possible as well. I mean, yeah. if we can have sort of uh, uh, Europe-wide recognition of the ingredients of cheese and marmalade, then surely we can have Europe-wide recognition no, no, of agree. human I rights. Agree. But, I agree uh, that you can. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's difficult to uh, the, find the way the political uh, will is robust, a, robust uh, enough to resist to the opposition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but um, uh, no, but I think this whole debate about the, the European Health Union is a, is a very good moment. But there will, we will need a um, uh, 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 push from, from you know, the grassroots because the political leadership is not going to touch this. It's toxic, they think. And the funny thing is that very often they are, they are lagging behind public opinion. 
you know, public opinion on these matters tends to be a lot more pragmatic. Um, and of course, this is this is something where most people who are uh, uh, who are facing this issue, uh, I mean, the cross border aspects of that is probably least of their concerns. But at the same time, if you know, we have population aging, uh, as Marco said, there's you know progress in medical science. Um, it may well be that more and more people want to at least have the opportunity, want to have more freedom, want to have more more choice. Um, and and yes, it's a delicate topic, but I do think that we should have this this European um, angle because indeed, if we can do it with the COVID certificate, then why can't we do it with with the living will at least? So the, the role of public in uh, this sense is very important. So it is, you know, it's as coming from us to, you know, through petition, through activism, to, you know, yeah. to, to raise awareness and also to, to, you know, to, you know, to raise attention from the politician on this yeah. topic. Yes, and I think it's also important to, uh, to uh, shine some light on the activities of the opponents because they are well organized. Uh, they are not publicly very visible. They keep a very, very uh, low profile. Uh, they have a lot of money uh, and they're very actively campaigning against these things. And they are actually, they're very smart in using indeed things like uh, the European Citizens Initiative, strategic litigation before the court of Luxembourg or the court of, of Strasbourg. Uh, they have, privileged access to the corridors of power because uh, for example if you are uh, you know if you're representing the vatican then uh, you're considered a diplomat and not a religious lobbyist so they they have and, and of course you know they have they have a lot of political influence and also influence over public opinion uh, simply through their uh, addressing let's say their their members and i think Everybody is entitled to, to try and influence political decision making, but it has to be transparent, it has to be fair uh, and measured. Uh, and I think most people really have no idea how influential these ultra uh, reactionary religious groups have become in the European Union. And uh, it's about time that we, uh, you know, that, that they are they're exposed to daylight. And paradoxically, in some way, they are more transnational, even if they are. Oh yes. Even if they are nationalist, basically, they are more transnational than uh, um, uh, pro-European, oh. uh, pro-civil life, because we tend, uh, because national politics uh, uh, tend to remain national, uh, but they are very smart in acting at the transnational level. This is one of the reasons why. We are trying to work to this idea of a, of a network of, of citizens, directly of yeah. European citizens, because we, we need something at least as transnational as they are to, to help national politics to, to go on on this matter. Yeah. Their nationalism is a, uh, it's just a pretext. It's a facade because they're very transnational. They have, funnily enough, they have a, a shared political agenda, which is a values agenda. It's, it's not about you know, uh, the, 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 the railroad network or uh, roaming costs or agriculture. No, no, it's exclusively about values and, and, and basically you know, the kind of values that we don't share usually. Uh, they call it, there is actually a kind of international manifesto called uh, restoring the natural order uh, so I think it's pretty clear what that stands for. And, um, uh, and, and the funny thing is they use the same language as the progressive forces. They talk about dignity, freedom, family, you know, but it's, their agenda is a wholly different one. And it's about time that progressive forces get out of their, of their, 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 their timid paralysis, you know, thinking that uh, it's very scary to say to people that these issues are also international issues. Because like in my country, you know, when you talk about these things, about euthanasia, abortion, uh, uh, um, uh, equal marriage and those things, then people go like, oh, but, you know, we have, we have achieved these things, these progressive steps. So uh, if you now take it to the European level, they may actually take it away from us. Um, but the funny thing is that by 
by by staying strictly within our national context, we're actually leaving the whole arena to the reactionary forces. Yes. Um, and 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 this has been going on for many years. Four, four years ago, I, I I published a book precisely about this topic. It's only in Dutch, unfortunately, but uh, we should really have the courage to take these things. It's like I think um, uh, what what Macron actually did a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago in Strasbourg when he 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 launched the, the French presidency when he said abortion is a fundamental right. I thought, whoa. I mean, okay, you can think about Macron whatever you like, but this is this is what what has to be done. Sort of you know claim these issues for for the European domain and not be afraid to say it. Yes, abortion is a fundamental right, full stop, and not be timid about it. And that's the kind of uh, the kind of debate that we need and the kind of courage that we need. And as I said, you may you may disagree and and, and criticize a lot of things that Macron did, but this was truly courageous. This was true political courage, and much needed. Yes, I agree. Very nice, thank you. So, uh, if you know, this uh, seems you know very far away sometimes from you know the general community. So, imagine um, you know that I am uh, you know a student or even uh, any kind of worker just doing my simple life, but I'm I'm sensible to this uh, topic. What what I can do, Marco, to you know to help you know and to fight for this how can jo i can join force with you and uh, work on that well, of course uh, uh, it depends uh, we're talking to an international audience so the commitment can be um, can be at the local level at the national level with a political party with election with organizations ngos international organization so there is not just one thing or one place or one way in which uh, um, you can get active to defend and promote civil freedoms and fundamental rights. Um, I think that what is uh, actually lacking now is uh, um, uh, civic participation at the European level. We need uh, uh, European citizens, not only national citizens, but also European citizens. And this, you need to do it also through civic participation. This is why we had this idea of, uh, of the Congress in Warsaw uh, for uh, humans in uh, 11 and 12 of March, uh, just to, uh, to create an embryo in a way of uh, a civic platform. Uh, you, you have different uh, one issue a campaign at the European level, level which is very good, uh, what is lacking, I think, is uh, European movement acting at the pan-European level. We have to work on that. Yeah. But it's, it's possible, and maybe we should also conclude on this, but there is a European public space. There is. The people who say that it's only purely national are absolutely wrong. And I think for already a couple of decades, we see this emerging. I mean, I remember... Uh, you know, when there was the invasion of Iraq, worldwide there were marches, people using the same slogans, the same symbols. We've had the, we've had the Occupy movement, we've had, uh, uh, you know, we have now, we have uh, uh, the, 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 the climate movement, uh, Greta Thunberg, the Friday uh, uh, student strikes, we have Black Lives Matter, we have me too. These are these are you know not even just European. They're global movement. And secondly, the populists, in particular those who are uh, uh, advocating the opposite agenda of what we are calling for, they are doing it. They are doing it. They have created this, and they are. Language is no barrier. They use social media. They use images. They use plain language. Um, they 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 do connect. They have recognizable leaders. Uh, and we should, as I said, we should get out of this this paralysis of, of, of being intimidated uh, and create this pan-European movement. There is, there is absolutely no reason why not, because this is typically something, yes, this kind of questions, end of life questions, unites everybody because everybody will be touched yes. by it. Every single person on this planet. Yes. So it's something which is irrespective of nationality, gender, 
uh, social status, income, education level, uh, religion, whatever. Every single one of us will be facing these questions. If there is one topic that should unite, should unite us all and bring people together, it's this. Thank you. And I, I think this is really the, the right conclusion on, uh, on this uh, topic. Uh, Marco, would you like to add uh, as well a conclusion no, I remarks? It, I think it was a perfect conclusion. Exactly. For me, so I, I'm <laughs> exactly. fine with it. <laughs> Perfect. So I, I'm, you know, I thank you both for you know, this very interesting discussion and open discussion. And I, you know, I, I hope we will continue soon. Uh, so we have a meeting in Barca, definitely, but it's a kind of everyday meeting for this kind of fighting. So I, and I, I wish that you know our community will multiply and join force with us on this topic. Okay. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Ciao Sophie, thank you very much.